الحمد لله نحمد سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We are continuing to address the issue of people in the Quran and the community we are addressing in this section is about the children of Israel and we've reached the point when Allah SWT points to us the story of their violation on the Sabbath. They were prohibited from fishing on Saturdays. And the story will come in the next slides which will show us in Surah Al-A'raf what the details of the story really are. The children of Israel have been marring their own relationship with Allah by frequent obedience, disobedience, repentance, disobedience again, back and forth all the time. So one of the tests Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them through is prohibiting them from fishing on Saturdays. So the story of Saturday will come to us here in Surah Al-A'raf. وَاسْأَلْهُمْ عَنِ الْقَرِيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ حَاضِرَةَ الْبَحْرِ إِذْ تَأْتِيهِمْ حِيْتَانُهُمْ يَوْمَ سَبْتِهِمْ شُرَّعًا وَيَوْمَ لَا يَسْبِتُونَ لَا تَأْتِيهِمْ كَذَلِكَ نَبْلُوهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ So the issue here is a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them through. He told them to not fish on Saturday. And on Saturdays, other than all other days of the week, where there was no fish coming to them, on Saturdays the fish would be flying over the water, right? Working its fins and tails, teasing them, and they cannot fish. Then one of them invented a way to throw the bait at the tail of the fish. And not to pick the fish, but as the bait sticks to the fish, he will hold the rope at the end in a stone or something to prevent the fish from running away. So this was done on Saturday. And on Sunday, he would pick the fish. So they looked at him and nothing was wrong. They said, this guy violated and nothing happened to him. But let's wait a couple of weeks more. Maybe it will happen. Nothing happened to him. So everyone started to create their own ways of manipulating the fish on Saturday so that they don't catch it on Saturday, but they catch it on Sunday. It is a trick that is known in manipulating the commands of Allah or the fiqh rules. It is like what people use today. So instead of calling riba in a contract, riba, they call it interest. They call it profit, right? So by calling it profit, the masses are easier to accept it. This is not riba, this is ribh. It's not riba, it's ribh, it's a profit. And all the scholars have agreed that all trickery is prohibited in Islam. Anything that you create to run around the rule is prohibited because you know in your heart of hearts 
that it is running around the rule. It is bypassing the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a magnified example of what it is to try to trick Allah while you are actually tricking yourself into his punishment. So what was the punishment for this violation? But let us go over the, the issue first. This is a village that was on a seashore and they lived on fishing. So whatever they fish is whatever they have for food, okay? And we know from before that when they were in the diaspora, in the desert, they used to get their food ready-made from heaven, right? They said, we don't like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limited their resources in that village through fishing. And then furthermore, as a punishment and a test, he limited the fishing on Saturday, and this was the only day where the fish comes clear, inviting you to catch it, even by hand. But Allah prohibited them as a test. Why? Because of their constant rebellion and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَذَلِكَ بَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ Then they were divided into two or three groups. One group was fishing and the other group was not fishing on Saturday. And the third group came from those who were not fishing. Those who wanted to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. They started to preach to the ones who were fishing and saying, how could you do that? How dare you violate the rule of Allah? That's very obvious and very clear. You catch the fish on, uh, on Saturday and you pick it out on Sunday. That is trickery. That is not right. And the third group that did not fish, they told them, why do you preach to a group of people who in their violation of Allah deserved his punishment and Allah said they will be punished they will be destroyed they said let us at least do our duty that we are bound with from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. قَالُوا مَعْذِرَةً إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ Let us do our duty and maybe they will fear Allah and quit. But did do, do, do they quit? No, they did not. Here the ayah says فَلَمَّا نَسُوا But as we said before, نَسُوا in the Quran most probably refers to negligence or ignorance, ignoring, not ignorance, ignoring the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they ignored what they were reminded of, what happened to them? I want you to pay attention to this one. Every community has people who commit disobedience, especially public disobedience to norm and to the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every community has those, right? We have people who try to park wrong, who have people who try to do everything, and we have others who would not do it. But the third group is the ones that are loved and secure to be saved if punishment comes. What is the third group? It is the group that stands for what is right and forbids and denounces what is wrong. الَّذِينَ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Those are the ones that Allah says, فَأَنْجَيْنَ الَّذِينَ يَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ السُّوءِ We've saved the ones who would stand to prohibit what is evil and what is wrong. What is the opposite of this? The opposite of this is declared for us in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in which he says, لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَتَنْهَوُنَّ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَلَتَأْخُذُنَّ عَلَى يَدِ الظَّالِمِ أَخْذَى 
ولا تأطرنه على الحق أطرا ولا تقصرنه على الحق قصرا أو لا يضربن الله قلوبكم بقلوب بعض ويلعنكم كما لعنهم. Unless you, for, you enjoin what is good and denounce and forbid what is evil, unless you do this, then unless you force the wrongdoer to correct his or her or their ways to match Allah's command, you have to stop the zalim even with your own hands if you can. And there are rules to govern this in the hadith as well. If you see something wrong, change it with your hand. If it is within the, your authority, to change it with your hand. If it is out of your authority to change it with your hand, change it with your speech. And if you could not speak, then at least denounce it in your heart. But to normalize what is wrong is to accept it and to support it and to legitimize it. So there are forces in every society trying to normalize what is wrong. And we see the degradation of values, ethics, and manners, and principles in every society, Muslim or non-Muslim. The degradation of values. Now, things that were taboos in the, ba in the past are now normal, if not the law. So who let things drag down to this point except the silence of those who know the principles, those who believe in truth, and those who do not want to speak for truth because of fear. We must fight the fear in our heart from anyone except Allah. If we do not get rid of our fears, we will not be even the second group. We will be marching with the disobedient, rebellious group. And we will be punished with them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وسلم, to tell us this fact. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, says, لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَتَنْهَوُنَّ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أَوْ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِنْ عِنْدِهِ Unless you enjoin what is good, denounce and forbid what is bad and evil, Allah will send punishment and torment upon you from Him. Can anyone escape the punishment of Allah? No one can. So we have to be serious about this issue. This issue is not a luxury issue. The issue of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil it is so serious that Allah, and it will show you here, Allah will turn the violators segment of the community into monkeys and pigs. This is how serious it is. Irrespective of whether this was physical or it was in any other way, that is not the issue. We know certainly in the hadith that disfigurement and deformation of this part of the community, uh, whether it happened physically, the Prophet ﷺ says, disformed beings do not last, do not live more than three days. So there is no such a thing as the children of the monkeys or the apes or the pigs or anything like this. They don't beget, they don't live for three days. This is certain in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. But the point here is, what about those who were disfigured? الَّذِينَ مَسَّهُمُ الْمَسْخِ Because of their disobedience. فَقُلْنَا لَهُمْ كُونُوا قِرَدَةً خَاسِئِينَ Despised and ignored and neglected and humiliated. They built a fence around themselves close to the shore to hide themselves from the group that didn't want to violate. And when they did the violation, 
the the fence gate was closed and they used to open it every day to sell some for those who want to buy right so on that day the day when they were punished the gate didn't open and the people outside kept knocking on the door nobody answered so they brought a ladder and they climbed and they found that everybody turned into a monkey and those who have been disfigured into monkeys they have uh, re the ability to recognize their relatives and friends but their friends were not able to recognize them so they used to ask them are you so and so are you my brother are you and they used to nod their head in agreement or shake it in disagreement so imagine if our ummah is in this bad situation as is and we still don't want to divorce fear and replace it with courage and love of Allah and love of truth to stand for truth this is after all is the most distinguishing factor for us as Muslims the only thing that we can use to claim that we are the best nation the best community Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ This is the khayriya of this ummah. You have been the best of communities sent out to mankind. So number one, we are sent to mankind. We are followers of the last messenger. And he assigned us to communicate the message on his behalf. Saying, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Communicate on my behalf, even if it is one verse. We let the cancer of corruption, tyranny, and oppression fester for generations. And then when we see things going in the wrong direction, we ask Allah to change it. Well, he had a rule. Allah does not change the situation of a community unless they change their attitude unless they change their ways we must look into our role and our responsibility in bringing righteousness first to our hearts second to our family thirdly to our community fourth to our society and our nation we speak a lot in general terms it is time to own to our individual family and communal responsibilities otherwise we do not become and we will have no right to claim that we are the nation Allah is talking about as the best of nations we are not until we do our duty and when we lower our own expectations of ourselves whether it is because of fear or gain we lower our back to our enemies and they take us for a ride and when they take your back they will never want to dislodge this is a serious issue it has been a serious issue for centuries Muslims used to rule the world and this is not the issue the issue is not to rule the issue is to guide the issue is to guide and direct humanity to where we all should be starting with guiding ourselves guiding our hearts we must love what is righteous before we are able to submit to righteousness we must love it but if we see what is righteous as a chore and a duty and a heavy chore for that we will never do it if we see prayer as heavy if we see this as heavy if we see enjoining the good forbidding the evil as heavy we will never do it who's going to do it it's like a child that you train and teach how to do a simple math problem and as soon as you finish they look at you and say 
but it is difficult. I cannot do it. You just did it. I just showed you. But they don't want to work their head. Or they don't want to put the effort. Or they see it as an obstacle rather than a pump that you have to cross over. In any way, when they ignored what they were reminded of, we saved those who used to forbid evil, those who stood for what is right and used to stand. And standing against evil will cause you trouble. It will cause you pain. You will be ostracized. Do you think you are the only righteous one here? Do you think you're right and everybody out there is wrong? You are in the minority. Those challenges are meant to demoralize your effort to reform the world that has run down into a low level of corruption. I had a visitor yesterday from a very famous serious uh, insurance company. And he was coming, wanting to deliver a speech about insurance, kind of insurance, life insurance, all of this to market their products to our community. And I started to discuss with him how Islam looks at insurance. And how is it that insurance is regarded as a deceptive contract? Deceptive contracts and I'm sorry, I will have to digress on this a bit because it's part of our reality. Deceptive contracts are contracts where you either sell what you don't know or buy what you don't know, or both. So the insurance sells you what? It sells you insurance. So what is insurance? Is it something tangible? No, it is a feeling. It's a feeling that you are secure. It's a feeling that you are insured. So in what way is it deceptive? Let us take the car insurance, which is mandatory by law. I'm not saying don't buy car insurance. You have to buy it. I have car insurance. But because you cannot live without it, not because it's halal. Okay. So car insurance, you may be paying for the car insurance company 20 years. Did anyone calculate this? How much would it be? 1,200 times 10 years is 12,000, right? 20 years, it's $24,000, right? And then you have a small accident that may cost the company 1,000 or $1,500. Immediately, they raise your premium, right? Because they want to recoup the money they paid, no matter how small it may be, because the rest of the 20 some thousand dollars have gone to the shareholders. If this is not deceptive, then what is? Likewise, you get health insurance and all other insurance. It's the same principle. They work for the shareholder and you are deceived into the fact that they are working for you. And most insurance companies, if not all of them, they have the fine print to enhance the level of deception. So even if you take a lawyer and go talk to a, an insurance company, you will lose. Because the fine print is something that nobody reads. So other limitations apply, for example, right? You read privacy agreements and all of this, other limitations apply. Other conditions may apply. Uh, the company may change the conditions at any time, even without notice. What does this mean? That they want everybody's money and they want to give you the least of service and penalize you if you make them pay. Finished with the story of the insurance. And I'm not saying don't buy insurance, buy it when you think it's necessary for you living in this society. So we saved the ones who used to forbid what's evil and we seized those who did wrong 
with severe torment for what they used to disobey. So disobedience and rebellion against Allah would cause them what? فلما عتوا عتوا عما نهوا عنه قلنا لهم كونوا قردة خاسئين when they exceeded the limits and violated the rules daring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the punishment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of bringing the punishment and he did back to the continuation of the story from Surah Al-Baqarah where we were فَجَعَلْنَاهَا نَكَالًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهَا وَمَا خَلْفَهَا we made this village nakal nakala is to make someone or something or a group an example do you know when when you have a class that you're teaching and a group of kids are creating trouble every class then you pick someone you make him an example and everybody subsides everybody goes back to their cool head so فجعلناها نكالا we made it a deterring example to those who were present and those who would come after who came after this community it is our community so Allah is telling us I am not telling you a story of the past about the past to entertain you but they have been made an example what kind of example a deterring example what is deterring example deterring examples are severe punishments that apply to part of the group to deter others from copycat so nobody would dare do it again this is the punishment that happened to that community and Allah is telling us deliberately it is meant for their contemporaries as much as it is for you you came after them learn from their experience and learn from their lesson I will stop here inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the best of communities and enable us to apply the qualities he expects of us Allahumma amin الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا اللهم اجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا اللهم اجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته اللهم ارحم أمواتنا واغفر ذنوبنا واستر عيوبنا وبلغنا مما يرضيك آمالنا اللهم لا توفنا إلا وأنت راض عنا اللهم بلغنا رمضان واجعله خير رمضان وارزقنا بركة وأجر رمضان اللهم ضاعف لنا في حسناتنا وكفر عنا سيئتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات من كل ذنب وأقم الصلاه